Hello, and welcome to Gamer's Table, a podcast discussion of tabletop role-playing games, war games, movies, books, and various other game-related topics. Be warned, this show contains some explicit material that may not be suitable for all audiences. Hello and welcome to Gamer's Table. My name is Eric. I'm Mike. This is Dan. This is Mark. I'm Jason. And I'm Sean. Oh, Mike just screwed it all. <laughs> He's up all the beat. <laughs> had to get all <laughs> comical on it. Yeah, I, 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 and I looked the, at Dan when I the did enthusiasm. It too. Yeah. Yeah. Notice it didn't skip a beat. <laughs> <laughs> this episode, we're going to talk about hobnobbing or interacting with well-known NPCs. Yes. This is Jason's topic, so I'm going to let him lead off. I want to lead off. Nope. <laughs> you just did. <laughs> well, let me see here. I don't know. I guess for me, playing Greyhawk most of the time that we've played, I've always enjoyed encountering those NPCs. Let me let me back up. I have not always enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Eli Tolmarath. Uh, that was a mistake. Because no, no, Mike I'm, twists. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking terrible. about bad guys. I know you're going to encounter Eli pro- prolific NPC bad guys. That's that's the game. We're talking about player character, not colleagues, but uh, contemporary. contemporaries. Right. Exactly. I'm Inter- talking interacting with ones that that everybody knows right. from in, this world. In Greyhawk, it's Morden Kanan, it's Tenzer. The, it's those guys in the book that have spells named after them. I would right. like to preface this entire episode with that's how the worst conversations start in game shops. Yes. This is how it goes when we talk about you know, don't tell me about your bullshit homebrew. This right. is what we're talking about. Dave well, have to believe himself. No, this is pretty common oh, for everyone's campaigns. <laughs> hmm? This is pretty common amongst No, all. yeah, no, it is. Yes, it is very right. common. But, but I think what, you, what, what you're saying is, oh, yeah, uh, my guy in, encountered Drizzt and, you know, um, blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, mm-hmm. oh, Elminster was my apprentice because I'm just infinitely badder than Elminster would ever be. You right. Know? Yeah. Well, I don't that kind of the, stuff. I don't think uh, that's uh, the normal problem. That's just nerds and Leo stuff. I don't approve, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. For me, like when we were playing years ago, Golden Age, whatever we want to call it. That was the 80s, right? No, this would have been the early 90s. Okay. <laughs> because Golden Age only means something to you. And comic book readers who I don't know, know what the hell you're that's talking why about. I, I did point that out. That I guess that was what we called it. Right, right. Yeah, we, we, called, we, called, we called our earliest gaming experiences Golden Age of D&D for us. Well, I was talking about, I guess, the latter half of the Golden Age, which would have been the 90s. Or maybe we call that anyway. It doesn't really matter. Fair enough. You know, we'll spend you, a lot of when, time on it for something. It doesn't matter. When you're, playing, uh, when you're playing powerful characters, eventually you're going to run into powerful NPCs. You have to. It's That's part of the game. Right. I, I don't know. I guess the way Mike did it, Mike did it right. Mike didn't really let them overshadow us. It right. was still us that was doing the mission. I think the thing that ticked me off a few times is, you know, you had these powerful mages, powerful wizards that would basically summon you, gather you, because they want you to do something. Right. You know, to, to save Earth or whatever. And, you know, yeah, they want you to do it, but they're really not willing to give you any help. You is, know? That, is that so much them or is it is Mike? Well, I'm, I'm sure it's Mike, but <laughs> for my character, that always ticked me off. I was kind of like, hey, you want us to do this stuff, but you're not willing to throw anything hey, away. Wait a minute. You're I way more powerful than us. Why don't you do it? Right. right. It's like even Gandalf came along. <laughs> this is a very good point. <laughs> but but did leave at one point. Well, yeah, he had shit to do. That's right. That's fine. <laughs> which, which that was Mike's, that was always Mike's explanation was that Morden Kanan is too busy to, to handle this part of it. He's got to do something else. Right. I remember. You guys will save the world. I've got potions cooking. So. <laughs> You don't know how volatile those things could be. <laughs> Sorry, I can't, I can't be bothered. <laughs> no, but I remember uh, it, it was something that Brian had once said to me. He always felt like there was always this monumental lack of respect from established, powerful NPCs towards his character. And he said that's one of the reasons why he did the things that he did, laying waste to cities and things like that. <laughs> because he wanted laying that respect. He, you know, it's like we could, we could do all these things and you know, we walk into town and people go, who are you? Right, and that was his his main motivation was to one up. You know, if if the if the big NPCs are going to not acknowledge me as a contemporary or as a you know as an equal, then I'm going to do something that's going to make me infamous, which I approve of. <laughs> D and D doesn't really have that kind of system. It's not built into the rules, like a, a reputation, right? I've talked about it before. But like L five R has the, the, you know that you've got your glory rank and uh, your honor honor rank, and it's like, oh well, you're this guy. I've heard of you. And I have to treat you appropriate. Right, exactly. There was one comment that we got on the, the message boards. By the way, this topic totally blew me away. Like, people were really into this, yeah. this idea. Yeah. 
I mean, I, it shouldn't surprise me from my days of the shop, but uh, yeah. yeah, people have lots to say when it comes to things like this. I appreciate, by the way, uh, all the people that participated in the oh, conversation. Yeah. It was it was awesome. Well, one comment that I took note of, one in particular, uh, was by a Damiani. He was responding to someone else who who had posted that he was confused why people would think that their canon characters feel like they're overshadowing. And he said that, and this guy's name was uh, Spectralent. He says, I'm not aware of any campaigns, or actually, there probably are, but they're rare, where it's not expected there'll be opposition more powerful than the NPCs. Why does it sting more when a canon NPC is more powerful than, say, a regular big bad? And A. Damiani replied, because they're the good guys. Generally speaking, the characters that people play are supposed to be good guys. Right. And uh, he goes on to say, they're what your PCs are supposed to be. When I play Star Wars, I want to be as cool as Han Solo, not a guy that runs errands for him. So I can kind of see where he's coming from. Yeah, you know. yeah. You want you want to be like Mike said, you know, uh-huh. a contemporary. Right. You don't want to be a lackey. Right. Of- now, I know for me, when my character, who was a, a fighter warrior type, was encountering Morden Kanan and those kinds of guys, I generally, you know, when they had something for me to do, that that was kind of, to me that was the relationship. That was the wizard warrior relationship. Right. Powerful wizard, powerful warrior. Powerful wizard knows things, and he wants you to go take care of it because that's your job. I didn't really have a problem with that. I did have a problem with, you know, it was different if they would come to you and say, go do this. This is important. This needs to be done. Right. I didn't have a problem with that. It was go do this now, treating you like you were their servant. That mm-hmm. that bothered me. I didn't like that. Right. Some of the comments that we had, a lot of people were saying, you know, it's okay for them to be in the background. You can go to Tatooine. You can go to Mos Eisley. You can go to the cantina, you know, and Max Rebo may be playing there that day or, or whatever. You know, Max he's there Rebo all week. Playing in Jabba's Palace. <laughs> I know that, but I'm just saying. That, you know, he, I'm, <laughs> they tour. And, uh, maybe the Bith weren't there that day. Maybe, <laughs> maybe he was slumming it. He, who knows? But anyway... In the background, cameos, things like that. Well, those aren't powerful NPCs, though. No, I'm just saying. Um, uh, let me let me uh, put it into perspective, like something recent. Monday, I'm running a Dark Times Star Wars game because Greg's wife just had her baby. Duh, Congratulations, Greg. So anyway, so he's going to be out for a while, and because there were so many people missing Monday, he just said, "Let's just go ahead and get started with the Star Wars that we're playing." So I'm running a, uh, an adventure, and the players are contacted or you know brought in contact with Bail Organa and put on a mission for Bail Organa. Did you find that as like overwhelming or anything like that or just felt like No, man, Jimmy Smith is always cool. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a point. <laughs> but he, he does usually end the show though. He does. But you know that that's the point. You know you, you can you can use guys like that as long as they're part of the story or moving things along. I, I, like this is also somebody who is a tertiary character even within the movies. So Yeah, but that one thing goes very far into putting you into that moment, putting you into that world. Yes. Right. It doesn't take much. That little Easter egg that says, yeah, yes, exactly. this, I now feel like this is where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if we were all just extras in your Bail Organa fanfic, that'd be something else. Right. Slash. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I know I joked earlier about having Morgan Cannon come along. On an right. adventure. But he wouldn't turn him down. Right, yeah, if he wanted to. Yeah, I sure wouldn't tell him no. I mean, obviously, I didn't really expect Mike to do that. But in this sense, you know, as far as, like, Star Wars goes, this would be akin to actually hopping a ride on the Millennium Falcon, and then Han and Chewie are with you on the whole adventure. Then you would feel kind of like second banana to these iconic characters. And most likely, and more, more times than not, I should say, if you're in a game like that, then it's really just the game master masturbating. Yes. Because right. really, you're just along for the ride to watch him stroke it, because you're not making any of the decisions. He just wants to play Han and Chewie. He wants right. to live out these things that he loves. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, whenever Jason brought this topic up, I and I think this is this is definitely backed up by the, the feedback we got online, the things we think about are Middle Earth. Right. We think about Star Wars games. Yes. Yep. We think about DC, Marvel, yeah. and maybe some big D and D characters because these are these are the IPs that we love and these are really big things. But they're one of the guys online. This was almost like a blow my mind kind of moment. It was uh, by Chrome Harlequin. He talks about his Cthulhu campaign. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yes, using real world people in the game. It's the exact same thing. And he's talking about like if we were in a World War II game, Churchill is a prominent NPC. That's right. part of. And I thought about how we could take 
real world characters make them NPCs in our the World War II superhero campaign and the yep. things that you can do with that right. I to have really never put you thought in. of that. I know. I was like, oh my god, in my brain, like. Poof. But he was talking <laughs> about a, C- a Cthulhu game. I'm like, just as good or Victoriana so, if you you know if you know your history, you know your history well enough. Injecting real people into right. these real world based games, not yeah. necessarily some fantasy. Well, I, and, and I'm gonna I'm actually gonna bring up another comment that uh, one of our uh, our listeners uh, goes by Skunk Ape. He he comments on a lot of our stuff. So I appreciate him doing so. And uh, I'll, I'll just read directly what he said. Since I generally run microbrew campaigns fairly exclusively, my powerful known NPCs aren't from any game canon. But he says in his current Western game, while he doesn't have any yet, the PCs have the capability of running into a host of uh, uh, heroes from American folklore. Uh. And he says currently he's looking to go up against Ben Wade and his gang. Yes, the outlaw from 310 to Yuma. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. I was like, what? I don't know. Now I realize that's who that is. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It kind of goes with what you're saying. You know, it's it's using historical figures or folklore, and really the main reason I brought that up is because he used the word microbrew. Yes, but <laughs> <Process completed. laughs> for using right. microbrew, the Get revolution has begun. Get well, I want to play in Skunk Ape's Wild West game. That sounds like fun. that sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Well, it's it's funny that you say that. You know, you said real world real. historical characters. I don't know if you guys remember this, but when we played Aces and Eights, somebody one of you needed to get a lawyer. I don't remember who it was. I think it may have been you. You bought it may property. Have been me. Was it Lincoln? It was Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, yeah. He was yeah. he was the local town lawyer. Oh, he that's wasn't awesome. He, he wasn't the president. He didn't go into politics. He just moved out west and became a lawyer. So you did lawyer. an alternate history. Well, that's he, that is the the setting of Aces and Eights. Yeah. Is it's an alternate history? Yeah. So, but I know better. He's a vampire hunter. And that's vampires true. Don't exist. <laughs> right. I, I was going to exactly. do that too. Exactly. I was, yes. was going to throw that. Um, out. Tess Rawl commented, and he kind of said something kind of like what you said, to put the PCs in a different role and play them in a different place on the timeline. You know, so like by the time the information comes that, you know, the emperor is dead, the, the rebels won, their reaction is there was a rebellion. You know, so you completely remove the characters from that canon information. Right. You still set it in the same world or the same universe and things like that. But that's an alternative. You could You could do alternative histories of Star Wars and things like that if you really want to. One of the other interesting comments that I saw was uh, by a guy who goes by the handle of Tomes, and he said in a Star Wars game that he ran, the characters were mostly young Padawans, and they had initially escaped Order 66. And I was going to say, I know how they end up. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. He, he describes that in, in a dismal spaceport, a worn-out Jedi Master with Imperial agents close behind asked the PCs to guard someone small and very precious whilst he led the Empire astray. Desperate, dark times. Desperate and dark measures were required, and they did, even though it cost some of them their lives. Little Luke would never remember them, but it didn't matter. Now, that's taking an iconic character who's an infant right. and putting them in, putting that character in their hands. I don't have a problem with that. I right. mean, I think that that's ba- you're taking those characters and you're putting them in the story. But in between scenes, maybe, or in between movies. You have movies. to know your players very well. True. Because mm-hmm. there is that temptation of just... Leaving it. Putting a bag over his head. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it you know, in the river. That's true. But, Hello, but that's, little Skywalker. How do you like cellophane? <laughs> but, but, <laughs> that is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, that, but there you go into GM Fiat. If that's the kind of stuff that your players are going to do... Right. And and you don't expect them to do that. If you would expect them to play their role, to not made a game, and they want to pull that stuff, then it's meteor out of the sky and boom, you're dead. I mean, I'd have to be more complicated than that, obviously. But not necessarily. Then, well, work you know, for Chewbacca. A, a, yeah, that's right. You work for Chewbacca. That's right. Chewbacca sorry. was meta gaming. That's, that's why he was killed. Right. That's why he was killed. He deserved. Ari Salvatore killed him from meta gaming. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, it's totally acceptable to me I like, now. I, I, like, I no longer hate R.A. I like before. sticking that knife in at any possible opportunity. <laughs> that, that is the kind of stuff we did back in the day when we were yep. pl- when we were first playing Star Wars. And that's because it, it's a very juvenile way of thinking. Well, I, I think it was more because we didn't have a lot of other points of reference. Our only points of reference were the movies. Yes. Right. The, the extended universe wasn't there. Right. They, yeah. The Old Republic wasn't there. No. You it, know, we didn't know about that stuff. It never right. would have occurred to me to play a game before or after the rebellion until I'd read the Thrawn trilogy. We'll see that stuff that that wasn't out yet. Yeah, that didn't yeah. come out until yeah. like this was one. Yeah, this was uh, late eighties when we were when we first played Star Wars in and West End. Yeah, I think we had a ship at one point that was ridiculously fast and had massive guns on it, and I mean so big that we could blow up star destroyers and crap like that. Oh yeah, right. racing Han Solo in the Millennium Falcon. And, That's the good thing know. about playing these games when you're a kid. Who wouldn't want to be better than their hero? Sure, but we've yeah. grown up now and right. we're still baby immature. Well, but now, <laughs> now, now we don't play the game long enough to level up to their level. Uh, no, we 
just we recognize the lameness as it's occurring. Yes. Um, maybe that's a rite of passage for gamers. Mm. You kind of have to go through. So you're talking like sowing your wild oats? Yeah, I guess. Mm. You know, you, you, you got to Rum springer, as the Amish call it. I was going to say, I'm Rum not Amish. Rum <laughs> springer. <laughs> Is it like spring break for Amish people? I would say as a general rule, I'm not a big fan of this kind of stuff because, again, I 